messed up. Amen. Woo! Let him mess you up. Hallelujah. You cannot get messed up and be dignified. Those just ain't going to happen. No. We let God take us out of that religious box. Yes. Do it, Lord. Your church needs to get messed up. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm excited. I don't want church as usual. Same old, same old. God is doing something fresh. Fresh and exciting. I'm making the throne. <laughs> I don't think Angel needs an introduction, but you're just the best. Yes, yes, she is. Angel operates as a prophet, as a teacher of the Most High God, and she's a girlfriend. Yes. Thank you. Praise God. Woo. You know what I heard? The Lord said, there's deliverance in the house. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but wow. What a shift. What a change. What a move of the spirit currently. I mean, there is something for us to really to tap into. And uh, this is all new. This is pretty overwhelming, actually, what's going on. And, um, you know, he says, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He wants all things to become new. But we have to get out of the way and allow him to do that, you know. And there's a groove. You know, I remember... Um, uh, years ago, I had surgery for something, and my doctor had asked me, hey, have you found the niche, the groove, you know, after you had the surgery, like, have you found your niche, like what you're supposed to do after, you know, just your lifestyle and all that? And I said, yeah, I've, I've found it. I've found it. But, you know, we have to find our niche in the Holy Spirit in order to tap into all that he's doing and all that he desires to do. You have to find that niche. You have to get into that groove, you know, otherwise you're going to miss what he's doing, what he's imparting, the transition that's happening, you know. Um, it's just an awesome time right now in the spirit. Um, you know, when I was first born again, one of my questions was, uh, you know, what is the, um, like, the, what's the word I can look for? Um, can you give me kind of a grip of what's this walk all about? And... Uh, all the Christians I spoke to had no clue what I was talking about. And I found it pretty frustrating because I felt like um, there is a place that we need to find, even as new believers, uh, so that we can, uh, like I was pretty much saying, get in the grit, get in the flow. And, um, but nobody had those answers for me. So what's so interesting I have found through the years, because I'm born again over 40 years now, that... Um, the very thing that I wondered about and hungered for and wasn't getting and was frustrated about, he downloads in you as you grow older so you can impart it to others, you know? And so um, what he's shown me, because uh, my, my thing was like, you know, um, can you sum up for me what the Christian walk is all about, you know? And nobody could do that. So through the years, this is what the Lord showed me. That this is really what the walk is all about. From the time we receive Christ to the time we go home, he said that our walk in him is wilderness, dry places, testings, blessings, and rest. That's it from beginning to end. And he also showed me that in the seasons of wilderness and dry places and testings, uh, you're going to have warfare in those places. And um, he showed me that, um, you know, you're going to, it's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to you, that you'll lose your spiritual equilibrium. When you have warfare like that, or in certain kind of warfare, you're just going to lose your spiritual equilibrium, and you're not going to really know, uh, you're not going to have a handle on what to do, or what's going on, or how to get up, or how to get out, you know? And so um, the Lord showed me that uh, we have to have um, revelation. And revelation on the walk. And sometimes you, when you just don't know what to do, you just have to train. Most of our walk is training. I've learned that. You, you have to train to just stay in rest. 
You're not going to have answers. You're not going to have understanding. You're going to go through seasons where people will forsake you and abandon you and won't care about you. And they'll love you one day, the next day they won't. And none of that is supposed to affect us. None of that is to bother us. You're not supposed to be tormented about it. You're not supposed to get mad at them about it. You don't get jealous at your friends if they have another friend or if God's promoting them or blessing them and it's not happening to you. You're in a wilderness. You're in a dry place right now. There's no blessings coming upon you and overtaking you and chasing you down. But your friend or your friends, it's happening to them. And you learn to rejoice with them. You learn. You don't, you don't ever get in a place of jealousy or competition or, gee, why is not it happening to me? You, you've, you learn to die to self. You know, and it's a place of bliss. It gets to be a place of bliss after a while because um, you learn and you train that is no longer I that liveth, but truly it is Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So I have always said this to some friends of mine, um, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And if there's no liberty in your relationships, um, God's not in it. You know, I had a friend, I still have a friend, um, or she had a friend, that, and she was telling me all the time that this friend was always putting her down and mocking her and, and saying negative things about her and to her. And I said to her, why are you hanging out with her? I don't get it. Because you're like, you're like beating yourself up. That's kind of crazy, you know? And, and she said, well, I keep forgiving her. And I thought, okay, that's good, but you're taking a beating. Like, why would you be around that? I don't get it, you know? Well, um, she, every time she'd be with me, she'd keep telling me about this friend that would verbally abuse her and emotionally abuse her and mock her and, and say things to her that were cutting and hurting. And every time she'd be with me, she'd tell me. So the Lord said, I want you to tell her to stop telling you about this abusal friendship. And so she... so. Next time I saw her again, she started telling me about this person. I said, stop. You know, you, know, you really want to know? I don't want to hear it anymore. Because if you're willing to be abused and stay in that relationship and take what she's giving you and not correct her in love, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. So, right, she never talked to me again about this friend. And in time, the Lord um, had her open her eyes and uh, walk away from the relationship. You know, and like, I didn't get it. Like, who, who would do that? You know, I mean, you want to be around people that celebrate you, not tolerate you. You want to be around people that love you and will treat you and respect you. And, um, you know, so that's what we need to do. What did I say all that? I have no clue. But anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Okay. Um, <laughs> so while I was in prayer this week, <laughs> somebody needed to hear it, right? While I was in prayer this week, um, <laughs> I was awakened at four o'clock in the morning. And uh, for the whole week, I've been in real intense prayer for this service. And uh, at four o'clock in the morning, I got up, I was actually awakened, and I heard very loudly. Now, I don't hear, you know, audible voice of God all the time. And uh, actually, um, most of us are led by the inward witness, you know, instead of the still small voice. We don't hear that all the time. Often we do, but not all the time. But I heard a very resounding, loud, authoritative word, and it said, Zoom. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's different. And um, so I said to the Lord, Zoom. And he said, this is what he said to me. I wrote it down. He said, um, I want you to begin to train to zoom into me and my presence every day. I want you to live and dwell inside. I mean, let's see. I live and dwell inside you, and as you zoom in me deliberately and consciously, as you zoom in me and on me, I'll be zooming in on my. You'll be. I'll be zooming in you. My anointing my power, my ability, my strength, my perfect peace and joy without the asking. Whoa. If you deliberately zoom in on my glory and my presence without the asking, you will have access to my anointing, power, ability, strength, perfect peace and joy. And then immediately he, he broke it down and he said, I am El Theo Christos. I am the anointing. 
And he said, I dwell in you. And he said, and I'm sitting on the shelf and I'm getting dusty because my church doesn't know how to tap into me and draw from me like a fountain. And he said that, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 10, 27, the anointing destroys every yoke that tries to come upon you, that tries to hinder you, that tries to weigh you down, that tries to chain you in shackles so that you'll not go forward. And then he says, um, Isaiah 26, because he said, uh, my power and my peace, my perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He said, you hone in on my presence. You will hone in and zoom in on my perfect peace. He said, my peace I give unto you, not that of the world, but my peace. My peace passes all understanding. For my peace passes all understanding. And um, so he says, Train again to zoom in, and that peace will come when you need it. And then he reminded me of Psalm 1611. He said, in my presence is fullness of joy, of joy. My joy dwells in you. My joy is in you. As you zoom in, I will give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. And he showed me we don't have to have an event to be joyful. You know, I've been in valleys where I needed to laugh, you know, and I'm in training right now and he's showing, it it was hysterical yesterday, you know, I had like really weird warfare yesterday and all of a sudden I just started laughing, but man, it, it was, it was Holy Ghost because there was an anointing and a power that was being imported to me as I, and, and I wasn't, I didn't laugh like, okay, I'm going to put on laugh, laughter. It was, it was from within yeah. and it came up from within and it was imparting to me. Like, you know, when I was a little kid, we used to run around our yard. My father used to put sprinklers and we would run through the sprink, spr- he looked like four sprinklers. We had a big yard up in North Jersey and he'd have like four sprinklers all over the yard. And us kids, we had, there was four of us. We'd run in and out of those sprinklers, you know, in the hot summer. And I felt like I was running in and out of the anointing. Uh, every time this laughter would come up inside me, I'd be refreshed. And it wasn't anything that I was trying to muster up, although sometimes we need to do that, which is faith, okay? But it wasn't me. I was just flowing with what was coming up on the inside of me. And, you know, why is that? Because I've been zooming in, you know? I've been zooming in, you know? So uh, I'm, I'm having access to that which has been broken, that which has not been tapped into, that which has been dormant, and I've always had, you know? So uh, there's a new thing going on, and uh, he wants us to partake of it. And then I said to you before, uh, uh, Psalm 1611, in his presence is fullness of joy. Okay, his presence dwells in us. That word joy in Hebrew is the word shimka which means laughter, glee, mirth, pleasure, rejoiceful, complete, supreme, and utter happiness. Complete. Hmm. I'm going to dissect that for a minute. You know how sometimes you go through seasons where you're not suicidal and you don't want to kill yourself, but you wish you were dead? That's the kind of warfare you've been in, okay? And you're not going to kill yourself. You're not suicidal, but you wish you were dead. You ever had kind of warfare like that? Okay? Well, the Lord showed me that when we train to Zoom, there's a completeness that kind of, again, it's like a well. It springs up. It's not anything you're going after. It's there already that you're tapping into, and it's like an anointing oil. He's just rubbing it all over you. You know, there is so much that all of us are not tapping into. You know, there's a scripture that says, um, in the midst of warfare, it says, but thou art rich. In the midst of warfare and in the midst of poverty, thou art rich, speaking spiritually. You know, why? Because there's a resource on the inside of us that the church really is not trained and knows how to tap into. I'm just learning this now. You know, new things, new strategies. 
And he says we'd be complete, we'd be full, we'd be full of laughter and glee and mirth. And it's like, um, we can't manufacture these things, but they're in us. And as we learn to get out of the way and drink from his cup, these things will automatically surge up within us. John 15, 11 says, um, I have spoken these things to you. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. I have spoken these things to you that my joy may be in you and that my joy and that your joy may be full. Wow. Okay. Have you gone through times where your joy's not full? It's not even there. You know, it's empty. You know, and he's saying that your joy may be full. Hmm. There's life in joy. There, you know, there's so much revelation. We don't even know what's in us, the fullness of the measure, what's in us. We don't really have a clue uh, what we have access to, what's inside us. And I believe because we're in the natural a lot, you know, we're um, not like in an evil way, but we're carnal Christians, you know. We're not deliberately being that way, but we are, you know. And uh, so God wants to change that. Um, oh, there was a scripture the other day. What was it? I'm trying to remember what it was. Mm. Okay, Holy Spirit, what was it? Okay. <laughs> Can't remember it. When I do, I'll get back to it. Okay, now, um, as we learn to Zoom, we are practicing the presence of God. Now, remember years ago, Brother Lawrence wrote a book, Practicing His Presence. Some of us need to read that book again. Because the Lord said to me, practice makes perfect. And we need to learn to practice His presence. So, you know, faith comes by hearing. And as you hear this today, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be activated on the inside of you. You know, we, we need to learn to not just hear and listen. Oh, wow, praise God, that was good. But, you know, you have to realize when you're under the word and the anointing, things are being activated on the inside of you. So it enables you to go home and walk in it that week and for the rest of your walk, as long as you know how to maintain that, you know. And it's like, you know, if you lose weight and you don't maintain that diet, you're going to gain the weight back. We need to learn how to maintain what we're flowing in. We need to learn how to maintain when God gives us a revelation and how to flow in something. We need to maintain that revelation and that experience, you know? Okay, so. All right, then I continued uh, to pray, and, and the Lord was giving me more um, words and more phrases throughout that whole day, and I was writing them down. And he showed me that these phrases and these words that he was showing me, like Zoom, okay, um, was like titles in the index of a book. And uh, he began to give me downloads on each thing he was telling me, each word and phrase he was giving me. The next phrase he gave me was, let it rain. And then he would expound to me what he meant by that. It's not what you think. You know, the word says, ask for the rain in the time of the latter rain. Well, it wasn't what I thought. I thought it was going to be that. But that's not what he was saying. Um, he was saying, let it rain. And, and he was saying, give yourself over. First, let me say this. This is what he said first. Allow me to be the faucet of your tears. Let it rain. Allow me to be the faucet of your tears. And then he said, give yourself over to my weepings. Give yourself over to the travails of the spirit because that's the season the church is in right now. Wow. It really is. I mean, every day I cry. It's not a sad, it's not sad. It's not poor self-image or poor self-me or it's none of that. It's Holy Ghost. And I don't even have to try and figure it out. I don't have to say, am I depressed? Is this a mood swing, you know? Is this menopause? I don't have to say any of that. I don't have to say any of that because I know it's Holy Ghost, you know? And you just let the river flow, man. You know, just let it go. You know? I, in fact, it's hysterical. I was telling my husband this the other day. I don't even wipe the tears anymore. I was like, well, don't even waste your time. Because I'm telling you, it's like a faucet. It's like a faucet. So you just yield over to it. You just yield over to it. There's an anointing in it, you know, because you're doing the work of the kingdom. Hey, I'm not out there. 
I'm not in Africa like, you know, anointed Mark, <laughs> you know. But I'm home and I'm anointed to birth things through the weepings and the travails of the Spirit. Amen. That's my call Amen. right now. I don't know if he has anything else, that's fine. But right now, that's what I'm doing. Amen. And don't get discouraged. And don't think that you're doing nothing. Just stay sensitive and stay yielded and out of the way. Okay, so he says, give yourself over to the weeps and the travails of the Spirit. And then he said, because the tears, he said, because the tears that are inspired by the Spirit, not your flesh, will always come to birth things. They're on assignment. They're there for a reason, for a season, and a purpose, a divine purpose. Galatians 4.19, my little children in whom I am in travail, let me look at the clock, okay, in whom I am in travail again till Christ be formed in you. Okay, the travail is the groanings and the weepings of the Spirit. Till Christ be formed in you. You are forming the will of God in whatever God is using you to pray about. Till Christ be formed in that thing or in that person. You may not even know. Nine times out of ten, I have no clue what I'm praying about, who I'm praying for, who cares. <laughs> I don't even wonder anymore. <laughs> who cares? You know, you just do it. <laughs> you just yield. You're a vessel, you know. And so uh, you train to be obedient, actually, you know. And then Jeremiah 4.32 I hear a cry like a woman in labor giving birth. Amen. That's talking about the bride. That's prophetic as to the New Testament bride. This was in Jeremiah, the Old Testament, okay, that Jeremiah was saying this. And so he was prophesying about the church, you know. Uh, Jeremiah 9.17 says, Consider and call for the mourning women to come and send for the skillful women which are seasoned intercessors, to come and weep and cry and let them make haste. In other words, come quickly. Let them make haste and raise a wailing over us and for us, that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush with water, for a sound of wailing is heard. This is talking about in the spirit realm, you know? And so I remember years ago when... Um, uh, I was in another church, and I headed the intercessory prayer. Uh, we used to go down to uh, um, Atlanta, Georgia. And John, you came with us too a couple of times. He was one of my intercessors, actually. And um, uh, Bobby Jean Merck, if any of you are familiar with her, uh, she used to head up what used to be called uh, Intercessors 500 meetings. And there were people from all over the world that would come. They were big. They were big meetings, you know. And um, she taught us and trained us how to, uh, you know, uh, the different kinds of burdens, the different kinds of pr uh, uh, groanings and, and birthing. And, like, it, it was like something I never heard, you know. And um, one of the things that she taught us was, well, actually, l let me just say this. I had never been in a public meeting with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from around the world where we were all on the floor weeping. And none of us worked it up. None of us did it. It was like, well, I guess I should get on the floor because everybody else is praying. It wasn't even that. It was an anointing that came on everybody. It was a glory, a holy glory that fell on everybody. And automatically, everybody just yielded. And, 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 and it happened. You know, we were just praying and crying and crying. I remember one time uh, she had a meeting where she had all of us uh, wash the feet of one another, you know. And um, I don't believe that we actually... Uh, I don't think we took our shoes off or anything like that. I don't remember that. But do, do you remember? I don't think we took our shoes off. Yeah. I don't. Th okay. Um, but I do remember that we all knelt at each other's feet. We took, you know, you had a partner. And you would kneel at their feet and pray. And they knelt at your feet and you prayed. And it was such a holy atmosphere that I, my, my partner was my sister-in-law. And I was weeping and I mean, I didn't expect that. I was weeping, and I went into travail and the groanings of the Spirit, and I began prophesying over her, and, and the same thing happened to her. But that was happening to everybody in the room, you know? And I'm going to tell you something. We haven't seen this in, like, 25 years, 25 to 30 years. But uh, there's a resurrection 
It's happening now. It's all coming back now. It's all happening now. The groanings and the trails, the weepings of the spirit. That's all you hear. That's all you're hearing. That's all you're hearing. The leaders that are moving in and introducing the flow and imparting it, you know, uh, that's all you're here now. And it's like, whoa, this is pretty awesome. I mean, who thought this was going to, you know, how God just totally and beautifully orchestrated this back into the church? Because you thought, in the natural, you thought, this, you know, church has really gotten carnal. How's that going to happen, you know? And it's just a beautiful move of the Spirit, and he knows how to introduce and bring us back into um, those things and those places in the Spirit that we need to do and we need to go. And so it's an awesome move of the Spirit right now. Okay, so um, the groanings and the travail of the Spirit carries a weighty burden, causing the person praying to have very hard weepings. Amen. They're very hard, heavy, deep cries right now of the Spirit. And, you know, you just go with the flow. You don't question it, and you don't, uh, you know, analyze it, and you don't... Um, try and even think how long is this going to be or, you know, you just, you just yield to it. You just yield to it. You know, you have to have the time to do that, though. You have to have the time to be obedient to this kind of intercession, this kind of prayer, you know. And so um, God will place upon you his burdens that will cause our spirit to birth breakthroughs, answers uh, via way of our prayers, by way of our tears and, and weeping. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burdens are light. So he will put his burdens on us. And let me just say this too. I know I've said this before when I was here, but I need to say it again. Um, you know, sometimes he will use um, a scenario or situation in your life that's sorrowful, or that hurts you, or um, is sensitive. Um, whether it's someone passed or someone um, that hurt you or whatever. Um, he will use that sometimes just to spark you. But don't park there. Don't park in the hurt and the emotion of it. He's using that as his flint. Okay? That's his flint. To get you up and out of your soul and boom, into the spirit. Start weeping and praying by the spirit. Okay? So you just need to yield to that. Right? Don't park in the emotional sorrows and the grievings. Don't do that. Don't do that. Allow him to take you from that plateau, boom, and launch you out into the boom, okay? Into the rocket of the Holy Ghost of travail and birthing, all right? Okay, so the other thing that he shared with me, all right, or a phrase, if you want to call it, is uh, dig in. Dig in. And then he expounded this, man, wait till you hear this, because this knocked my little spiritual socks off, okay? They went across the room, okay? All right, dig in. He said to me, the hard places of your heart, your life, and your walk need to be turned over and tilled. Hebrews 10, 12, break up your fallow ground, which is uncultivated ground in hard ground, uh, for it is time to seek the Lord. How do you break up hard ground? How do you break up the earth that's not been touched or have had a spade in it and turned it over and, and, and get it ready for seed? How do you do that? He says, to seek the Lord. Time to seek the Lord. That's the spade or the shovel that will till and turn over that hardened ground that's in your walk or in your life or in your prayer life or even in another person's walk that God will um, put his burden on you for them, okay? You know, there's a, there's a scripture that says that the heavens are like brass. Do you know that's a curse that you and I are redeemed from? We're redeemed when we pray and the heavens feel like they're brass. That means nothing's moving. It's like, hitting that, that brick wall. Nothing's moving. We're redeemed from that. Amen. And, you know, when you put God in remembrance of that, okay, um, you're in his presence and you're reminding him of his word. He said, put me in remembrance of my word. Let us plead together so you're not alone, all right? So when you hit hard ground on behalf of someone else when you're praying or even somewhere in your own life, 
and you put him in remembrance of his word, you're putting that spade in the earth, in that hard ground. You're putting that spade in, and you're turning it. Because no one's gone before you. No one's gone before you and have tilled that land. No one's gone before you and have broken up that hard earth. No one's, that's why it's like brass. <laughs> it's hard. It's not moving. This thing's not budging. Sometimes it takes a few times to break up that fallow ground. Sometimes it takes a few times. Have you ever walked on hard earth? I mean, hard ground where you, you couldn't even get a shovel in it. I'm, like, I'm telling you, it's like that in the spirit sometimes when you pray about something or someone. He's waiting for someone to go in there that has enough tenacity and has enough faith that's not moved by that hardness and has more faith in the one that's uh, able to break up that ground through your obedience. Amen. You see, we work together with the Spirit. And so he says, break up your fallow ground, the uncul uncultivated ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Ground in the, in the Bible will always represent the different types of Christians and their walk. Fallow ground is inactive and has no change. It has no fruit. It has no life. It's a picture of false stability. Mm -hmm. It is overcome by weeds, and this ground puts up a fence to surround it. Fallow ground hides from harsh endeavors and the pain of the plow. Whoa. The plow is what breaks up that hard ground. So the fallow ground hides from the harsh endeavors of the and the pain of the plow. Keep in mind that word pain of the plow. Okay? It never lets the farmer into the land. It wants to be safe and undisturbed. I'm going to tell you something. When he was downloading this to me, I faces came in front of me that I know. Spirit people that are saved. This describes them. Fallow ground, hard ground. You know? Because again, ground represents Christians, okay? All right, so therefore it remains old. Talking about the fallow ground again, okay? Therefore, fallow ground, untouched ground, hard earth, that's not tilled, has no seed, has no life, okay? It remains for years. Old and neglected wine in an old neglected wine skin nothing changes nothing new the land will never see fruit or the wonder of sprouting seeds in life because it's stubborn but the fallow ground is dug into plowed and, okay but when fallow ground is dug into plowed and turned over and tilled it allows itself to be broken and disturbed by allowing the preparation for growth. Okay, well, let me read that again. It okay, but when fallow ground is dug into, plowed, turned over, and tilled, it then allows itself to be broken and disturbed, allowing preparation for growth and life. Hmm. That's talking about our walk. Duh. The ground knows that miracles follow the plow. Ouch. That plow hurts. Ouch. Ouch. On this ground, peace is shattered when the plow comes and the ground lets it come. It knows the new that it knows that new things are born, mature, and grow from being disturbed, upset, turned over, bruised, and broken. This is not talking about fallow ground. This is talking about ground that's willing to be tilled, okay? The Christian that's willing to yield to the dealings of God, yield to the weepings of the Spirit. The ground embraces, this ground embraces the painful plow to become God's garden of life. The ground knows the price and embraces the turbulence. Too much 
abundant, to bear much abundant fruit. As believers, we have a choice of which type of ground we want to be. So by embracing and allowing the dealings of God to dig deep within us, to break up our hard, uncultivated ground, we know we are choosing life. Joel 3.10, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I am rich. Sometimes you've got to prophesy to that untilled ground. And he's saying, you better say, where you're weak, I'm strong. Where it's poor, you better say, it's abundant, it's prosperous, it's flourishing, it's rich. So we're in training, we're learning, you know, how to speak to lack and and death and dry places and, you know, how to prophesy to the dry bones and to the dry land and to the dead earth and spiritually speaking, okay? Um, we can remain untouched and have, e- and have easy living and have absolute no life. And it's interesting that there's no middle ground. Either you will be a fallow ground or you will be willing ground that still has areas that are, that is, um, uh, hard, but you're willing, you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come and break up that fallow ground, but you have to flow with it. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? You have to be in agreement with the move of the Spirit, and you have to be in agreement with what he's doing, what he wants to do. Otherwise, there's going to be no transition. There's going to be no change. There's going to be no impartation. There's going to be no anointing. There's going to be no fruit. You know, we have to participate. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So you're embracing and you're allowing and you're doing what he's doing willingly. The other word he gave me was purge. He said, God's power will come with a price, and it's called purity. I'm going to tell you something. He's been cleaning house, mopping it up, man. He's been mopping it up in my house. I mean, this house. It's this not my house that I live in. This house in here. <laughs> He's been mopping it up, you know? <laughs> He's got the vacuum cleaner, he's got the Kleenex, he's got Mr. Clean, he's got those sanitation wipes, he's got, he's got uh, the mop, he's got all kinds of things going on at the same time. And um, I'm embracing it all. And the minute you get in the flesh, you can't handle it. The minute you get in the flesh, you can't handle it. Because you see, it's not by might nor by power by his spirit. And the true sons of God are led by the spirit of God. Because that's where the rest and the peace and the obedience comes in. You got to stay in the spirit all the time. All the time. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have opportunities to get mad at people. You're going to have opportunities to get hurt by people, offended by people. But when you catch those little foxes, nothing bothers you. Nothing bothers you because you're on it. You're on it, man. You're on it. You're, fl- you're, you're in the flow. You're on it. You're king. You're as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. You know? There's a scripture that says, um, Behold, I have made you a new sharp threshing sledge. You shall thresh the mountains and pulverize them and make the hills as chaff. You have to stay in the Holy Ghost for that to happen, though. You know? You have to stay in the Spirit. And really, that's what it's all about. I have just been, really, it's quite humorous. (laughs) I have been in a place where it's just like, the sermon is so crystal clear right now. You know how you go through seasons like you just, right? Judy, I know you know what I'm talking about. You go through seasons where it's like your discernment's so amplified and like, man, nothing's getting by you at all. And it's just a season, you know, and he's sharpening and honing that discernment in you. But you're in a season where he's highlighting it and amplifying it and sharpening that anointing and increasing it for a reason. See what you're going to do with it, first of all. But also to see if you're going to yield over to it, you know. And don't get in the flesh with it. How do you expound and get more ground in discernment? Staying in the spirit. Staying in the spirit. You know, I had a couple opportunities this past week. 
to be offended. But you know what? Holy Ghost, so cool, man. Didn't skip a beat. Bang. Didn't skip a beat. Just the Lord said, don't. Just let it go. But it wasn't hard. It wasn't a hard thing. I remember like a couple years ago, if he said this to me, and I went through this thing, I would have been like, I would have been struggling with it. I would have been wrestling with it, you know? You know, and it, but, but this time there was no wrestle. There was no struggle. There was like, yeah, cool. Boom. And you just keep on keeping on. You know, he says, um, uh, straight and narrow is the road to eternal life. And very few there be that find it. Now, that's talking about heaven, yes. But it's also talking about the eternal life of the spirit and in the spirit. You know, it gets narrower and narrower. And, you know, after a while, it's like you're walking on a tightrope. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Whoa. And you just keep going forward and you stay balanced in the spirit. You see? You're not falling off because it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. You know? And then when the fiery darts come, you got, you got to dodge them. And, and, they, and even if they start hitting you, you stay in the Holy Ghost, they won't affect you. They won't. They won't hurt you. They'll come. You'll recognize them. But they won't affect you. They, they won't um, harm you. They won't take you down in your soul. And one of the things Jesus said was, possess ye your souls. And one of the things to stay in the spirit is you have to possess your soul. Because your soul's going to go through things. You're going to get warfare. You're going to get attacks. You know, how do you possess your soul? Well, taking captive every thought and imagination, every high thing that's all itself above the knowledge of God, you know, bringing it into the obedience of Christ, you know? You, I mean, you are taking that thought and you're, you're taking it and taking it captive and you're bringing it, boom, at the cross and laying it down at the foot of the cross and you're bringing it to the obedience of Christ. And you're saying no to it, you know? You're not allowing it to dominate. You're not giving it place. Don't give the devil place. Take no thought, Jesus said, okay? All right, let's see. Um, all right, so I said purge, right? I was up to purge? Okay. All right. All right, so... Um, God's power will come with a price, and it's called purity. All right, I said that. All right. 2 Timothy 2.21. If anyone cleanses and purges himself from all sin, he will be a vessel of honor fit for the master's use. If anyone cleanses and purges himself. But let me just say this. When you are not cleansing and purging yourself, the Holy Ghost will help you. <laughs> and sometimes it's not always pleasant. Why? Because you're not obedient. You're not doing the word. So it's not like he's, you know, hurting you, but, you know, he chastens those he loves. Okay? And you got to catch that. You have to be quick to hear and quick to repent and catch what he's doing all the time. All the time. All the time. Okay. Matthew, uh, Malachi 3, 2, for God will be like a purifying fire and a fuller soap. Wow, when that fire comes, man, I'm going to tell you something. When I was a kid, my father didn't spank us. He beat us. It was just that generation, you know? <laughs> and when he beat us, he'd have us go to our room. And you would sit there for about half hour, and he would want you to think about what just happened. He want you to think about what you just did. Well, you didn't think about what you just did. You thought about how much you're in pain for that half hour, okay? And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you really felt the sting of when he would beat us, you know? And now God doesn't beat us. He's not brutal. But let me tell you something. When he deals with you... It reminds me like when I was a child, man. I, I'd, I used to sit on my bed staring at the floor in pain, you know. He, to, he totally humiliated. My father totally just humiliated me, you know. <laughs> I guess that was, the, that was the point, you know. And, um, <laughs> you know. And I would sit there, you know, totally humiliated and burning and full of pain and stuff like that. And, like, you know, uh, it reminds me when the Holy Spirit deals with us. It, it, now, it's not brutal. Like I said, it's not brutal. I'm not comparing it to being something brutal or, or abusive, all right? But it is like that. Will you feel the burn of the fire, of the reproof of the Spirit, the correction of God? 
He's a consuming fire, and it says he's a fuller soap. I looked that up. You know what fuller soap is? Fuller soap is a bleaching, um, it's a bleaching, um, yeah, yeah, it bleaches. So where there's stains or there's darkness, man, it's bleaching it out. Have you ever put bleach on, you ever had bleach on you? It burns, baby. It burns. So, you know, you're getting it here and you're getting it there to consume, you know, the purifying fire and the fuller soap, you ain't winning here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well yield over to it, you know. <laughs> Either way, hey, you know. Okay, Dad, I'm getting it, <laughs> you know. Okay, now Second Timothy two twenty one. If you stay away from sin, you will be like one of those dishes made of purest gold, the very best in the house, so that Christ Himself can use you for His highest purposes. Wow. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I'm sure all of our parents had like a curio cabinet or a china cabinet where she, they had their best, you know, china and dishes and silverware, and it was out on display, and on occasion you would get it out and use it, but it was on display because it was a pretty pattern and stuff like that. And well, you know, God does the same with us. You know, you yield over to what he's doing in your life, he'll make you look real good. You know, I crack up because I say to the Lord, I said, look, I, I, I live with myself, so I know what I am. So when you use me to your glory, I'm, I'm really amazed because, uh, you know, he loves us. And he, he just puts you out on display because you were a good girl that week, okay? <laughs> and that's, that's how it works. <laughs> the greater glory, the greater anointing, because you were a good girl that week. You were willing and obedient, you know, and that's how it works. I'm telling you, he's a good father. He does that, you know? So, um, all right, so uh, Psalm 24, verse 3 says, uh, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has, now it's asking a question, all right? Who's going to stand in your holy place? Who's going to stand in the hill of the Lord? And then it answers, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Wow. That scripture I claim and I confess a lot. Create in me, O oh God, a clean, heart, a clean conscience and a pure heart, and renew in me a right spirit. You know how many times we don't have a right spirit? I've been corrected a couple times this week. You have to catch when God's doing that. You may think you're right, and something inside saying, Pfft, you blow it, baby. And, and you, like, ignore that at first. I'm cool. Everything's fine. You know, and then you keep, you know, you keep getting that, mm, you blow it, baby. You better get my presence here from me. So I've done that a couple times this week, and he showed me I was wrong. I was like, wow. You know what? Humble pie is good. <laughs> Tastes good. Daddy rewards that. Daddy rewards that. There's promotion in humble pie. You know that? You don't care about your reputation anymore. There is no reputation. Because you no longer live. <laughs> but Christ lives in you. And the life you now live, you live by faith in the Son of God. Hmm. Okay. All right, and the other thing he told me was the word, stay. And he said to me, stay at the feet of Jesus. This is a spiritual posture that will bring God's manifest glory in your life, whether you're in the valley or on the mountain. True. And then Luke 10, 39 through 42 talks about when Mary, uh, Mary, Martha's sister, sat at the foot of Jesus, listening to him as he talked. But Mary was the jittery one and was worrying over the big dinner that she was preparing. So she came over to Jesus and she said, uh, Sir, um, doesn't it seem a little unfair to you that I'm, you know, that my sister's sitting here, you know, and, and I'm going around doing all this by myself like... Uh, you know, what's wrong with this picture, Jesus, you know? And uh, so Jesus, and he says, tell her to help me. But the Lord said to her, Martha, dear friend, you are so upset over all these little details. And there is really one thing worth being concerned about. And guess what? Mary has discovered it. And I'm not going to take it away from her. Shoo. You know, there was a song years ago that, that was, the, the words were, uh, you got to know when to hold them. 
and know when to fold them and know when to walk away when the dealing's done. I'm telling you, you got to do that in the Holy Ghost too. You got to know when to hold it and when not to hold it. Let it go. And you better know when the deal's done, man, what you got to do. You got to know when. <laughs> Come on out, join me now. <laughs> Don't get me started, John. Okay. <laughs> okay, and the other thing he told me, and I have what, one more thing. Um, he said, hear. Matthew eleven fifteen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Many in the church don't catch what God is saying, especially when it comes to him dealing with them or correcting them. Mark eight eighteen. Though you have eyes, you do not see. Though you have ears, you do not hear or listen. Revelation 3.19. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love. Listen to this. I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults, instructing them. This is amplified. So be enthusiastic and repent. So he's saying, don't just repent. You better be enthusiastic when you repent. <laughs> I'm back in the room again. My father beat me, you know. <laughs> Oh, my God. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so be enthusiastic and repent. Changing your inner self. Amen. Wow, isn't that interesting? Changing your inner self. Your old way of thinking and your sinful behavior. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And then Hebrews 12, 6. The Lord disciplines those he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. There's no escape. There's just no escape. You know? It's going to happen. So you might as well embrace it, suck it up, and allow no pride. You're going to have to learn to suck it up, really. And after a while, it's, it's, you don't have to suck it up. It's just normal. You know, you feel like a soldier, you know? Um, sir, yes, sir. Really, it's like that. I'm telling you, right? It's like that. Sir, yes, sir. And God will say, at ease. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's see. All right, I'm going to go on to, uh, I don't even, what time are we supposed to stop here? I don't even know. Okay, I don't even know. I don't. Even... All right. Okay. So, all right. Carry on. Is another one. Carry on. God's grace has built within us a resilience uh, for us to lay aside and lay hold. I mean, for us to lay hold of no matter what comes our way or hits us unexpectedly. There is a grace that is built within us with a resilience. And so, when we get hit spiritually with any kind of warfare, um, we can carry on. Because of this resilience, because of this gracing that's on the inside of us, it's all automatically built on the inside of us. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I think a lot of the church has a head knowledge of that, uh, but they don't have the experiential revelation of that. Yeah, and, and they're not walking in the light of it, you know, because that's talking about power. Grace is power. And how many of the church isn't walking in power? And I'm not saying that in a condemning way because there's so many areas in my walk that I'm not walking in power yet, you know? But God's still working on me. We're all, of, all of us are still on the potter's wheel, you know? Ever learning, ever learning, ever growing, you know, having him continually work in us. Proverbs 24, 16, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up every time. Why? Because of that built-in grace, that built-in resilience. All right, and then I'm going to end with this. I, I have a couple more, but, I'll, I'll, you know, let's just move on. Okay, so um, who am I talking to, right? Okay, Galatians 9. I'm talking to myself, all right. Galatians 9, 6, 9. And let us not grow weary in well-doing and get tired of doing what is right. For in due season we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged, faint, and give up. 
wow, isn't that good? And then, I, and then I will close with this. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in, in, and in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am am strong. Again, Zechariah 4, 6, not by my, nor by power, but by my spirit. And then Proverbs 4, 24, 19, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Hey, I fainted in a lot of adversity. I still do sometimes. And he's showing me your strength is small. And then I said, why is our strength small in the day of adversity? And he said, let me show you the roots and reason why in the time of adversity, uh, the church's strength is small. And he gave me Daniel 11.32. I've never heard teaching on this. This is what he shared with me, okay? Daniel 11.32. But the people who know their God shall be strong. Whoa. And do mighty exploits. Whoa. So, how else can we get to know God so that we can be strong? James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. What's so interesting about us drawing near to God? You know, when you're in a dry and thirsty land, you don't feel God. You know, and it's like, where are you, God? Where's the anointing? And he says, draw near to me. But when you draw near to God, what's so cool? He says, I'll draw near to you. So we take that one step, but you know what's so cool? He takes three steps toward us. We take one toward him, he takes three toward us. That's just how he is. That's his nature. That's just how he is. He's love, you know? So that's one thing that will help us to get to know God and get close to God. And then I will close with this. I think I said this about five minutes ago, right? Jeremiah 29, 13, but I will close with this in Jesus' name. Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Whoa, isn't that good? All of your heart. Hallelujah. Wow, wow, wow. I had a couple more, but you know what? I'm going to stop there because we're supposed to be moving prophetically, right? And um, all right, so hallelujah. You know, um, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Chew. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. You know, uh, before we just move prophetically, I just thank you, Lord, that there's a blanket in the spirit realm that I see here that's just hovering over us. And right now, I just see it falling on us. And I just want you to saturate us with all that you've spoken tonight. There's a new deposit. There's a new impartation. There's a new gracing here. That right now, in Jesus' name, whoa, 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 whoa. Just close your eyes for a minute and receive that. Whoa, in the name of Jesus. Shoo. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. Ah, shakara mande sikia baba sata. Yeah. And Lord, let it not just cover them. Let it saturate them. Saturate them. So when they walk out of this place, Wow. They're not even going to walk the same. They're not going to be able to talk the same. They're not even going to think the same. They're not even going to feel the same. In Jesus' name, because the anointing brings shift and change and increase, and it breaks things. It breaks our hard grounds. Father, I thank you that everything that was spoken tonight, you had the right people here tonight. And it's not falling on fallow ground. It will produce fruit to your glory in the name. In the name of Jesus, amen, 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 amen. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I was a real good girl. I was so good. She put you on a pedestal tonight. Thanks, Dad. That no. was good. It was good. It was good. God's good. Okay. Wow. God's fun, isn't he? God's fun. He knows to have. He knows how to have fun. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do you want me to get over there? No, you're fine. You sure? Okay. Yes, yes. That was my favorite. Thank you. 
You Thanks. You were a Thank riot. You. Thanks. <laughs> in a very godly way. Thanks. In a yeah. very annoying way. Well, God has a sense of humor, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we have to have joy. Count mm -hmm. it all joy. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That was excellent. Ooh. Thanks. Excellent. 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 Thank Anybody God. relate to what she just oh, said? Yeah. <laughs> Got the right group? <laughs> Amen. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Nothing's in vain. Amen. 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 What we go through, we give. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Amen. With the comfort you receive, you comfort others. Amen. Praise God. Wow. Well, let's shift into the prophetic, not that this wasn't, because that was prophetic teaching, but now we're going to shift into the gift of prophecy and personal prophecy, and we'll just see where, where God takes us. We didn't talk about this. I have no mm. idea. I have no anything for anybody, but God does. So we just want to tap in. We're going to hone in together and just avail ourselves to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray, and let's just ask Jesus to Amen. speak. The spirit of prophecy Thank is the Lord. spirit of Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, Father, we just avail ourselves right now to you, Lord. We yield ourselves. Yes. We yield ourselves as vessels, Lord, for your honor and your glory. And we're asking you, Father, to come tonight in the ministry of exhortation and comfort and edification and strengthening, Lord, that you would speak to your bride, that you would encourage her tonight, that you would minister to her. And, Father, give instruction, Lord, and wisdom and counsel, whatever you desire, Lord. We just pray that we would be accurate, that we would flow together with heaven, with one another, that we would hit the mark and hit the target, Lord. And, Father, we just yield to what's on your heart for your people tonight. Yeah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. Ooh, wow. Strong anointing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, pray in the spirit and uh, draw from the gift.